My name is Dr. Harry Witchell, and this is a screencast of lipids in atherogenesis. It's part one of a three-part screencast. In part one, we'll talk about the rationale and complexities of lipids in coronary heart disease, and in particular, why it's so difficult to study and why so many difficult issues about research have to be raised, rather than simply presenting the topic as a done deal. Part two will be a summary of the topics needed for the exam. And in part three, we'll go through some sample problems for testing yourself. So what causes atherogenesis? The key thing is we still do not fully understand everything that we need to know about atherosclerosis. There are two theories that date all the way back from the 1850s, and these two theories are not mutually exclusive. Although for 100 years, there was a huge argument among scientists as to which of the two would be right. The first one is called the response to injury hypothesis, or more recently, response to endothelial injury hypothesis. This is the idea that atherosclerosis is some part of an uh, injury to a blood vessel, particularly the endothelium of the blood vessel, which ultimately leads to further problems. And this process of injury and its response to the injury will involve inflammation. The second possible theory, dating from the 1850s, is the lipid hypothesis. It's been known for a long time that if you look at the damaged region of uh, atherosclerotic vessels, you will find a lot of lipids, often lots of cholesterol. If you look at individuals as young as 19 years of age, they will already begin to amass the seeming precursors of atherosclerosis, so-called fatty streaks. And in these fatty streaks, there are lipids and cholesterol. The idea is, if there is lipids there, it might be the smoking gun, the actual cause of the damage. Oh, we now know that lipids seem to contribute to the damage or the response to injury that is part of it, that the response to injury and the lipid hypothesis can both be correct. Now, there's a third theory worth knowing about, which is the oxidative damage hypothesis. This is actually a subset of the response to injury hypothesis, which suggests that oxidative damage, that is damage to blood vessels and the molecules inside of blood vessels, are, may be caused by oxidative damage, that is damage due to oxygen radicals, peroxides, etc. What we don't know about lipids and their relationship to atherogenesis plays as much a role for what you need to learn as what we do know. So things we don't know are why do LDL and cholesterol esters accumulate in atheromas? It's not something that's really well established. Oh, slightly better established is why do atheromas initially act as immune attractors? Certainly, it's clear that atheromas act as immune attractors later in the process of atherosclerosis when there's so much damage and a lot of uh, damaged molecules that need to be dealt with, as well as damaged cells. But the initial cause of the macrophages and cytokines appearing is not clear. Finally, why do macrophages and smooth muscle cells consume so much lipid to the point where they self-destruct? From an, We understand quite a lot about why macrophages and immune responses are attracted to the, the process by which they are attracted to the atherosclerotic plaque. But we don't know is why they continue to consume lipid to the point where they self-destruct, Why would they, which would obviously lead to further problems with atherogenesis. The extremity of the problem doesn't make sense if you make some sort of logical argument as to why the body would be designed this way. This leads to the issue about the problem of learning atherosclerosis in a medical curriculum based on teaching facts. Oh, the information that you're going to come across comes from two completely different perspectives. Now, they both share some of the ideas and the same goals, which is to save lives, but they have a quite a different focus. In the public health perspective, the issue is how to save lives now, and that's looking at the various issues about associated risk factors and specifically trying to save the most lives based on the most obvious causes. However, scientific research has a slightly different focus, which is looking at the specific causes and therefore possibly the cure. Oh, 
there are issues with the scientific research, such as the answers are not going to be absolutely certain. The answers may change in the future. At some point, the answers may end up being controversial. And at many points, we'll find that there are gaps in our knowledge. Why do BSMS need students need to know about this sort of research? Well, as you know, the General Medical Council has a requirement that you must be educated to be a doctor as a scholar and scientist. So there's no way out of it. Somehow you've got to understand something about the research and not simply how to treat patients. Now, why do we teach doctors about a topic where the research is incomplete and the findings are often controversial? Well, you're going to be practicing for quite a number of years in the future. We already know that atherogenesis is a long-term process. Serious disease seen in 50-year-old patients seem to have precursors in healthy people who are as young as in their 20s or 30s. Now, it is true that the treatment is going to involve risk prevention. Now, the causal and mechanistic relationship between risk and cardiovascular disease can be controversial. Risk is a statistical association. It is not necessarily a cause. So we, here we are, we're treating risk, but the risk isn't necessarily a cause. It's simply a statistical association. Now, given this is going to involve treating many healthy patients in the sense that many of these patients will have no symptoms. So we, in comparison, we're also looking at hypertension and hypercholesterolemia, both of which have patients who nominally often have no symptoms, but necessarily get treated for their risk. How do we justify this? Well, this leads to a bigger question from a research perspective, which is how is the scientific establishment convinced? Oh, if you want to show that A causes B, so let's say for argument's sake that A is a high lipid diet and B is cardiovascular disease. If you want to show that A causes B, the first thing you would likely do is show that there's a statistical association so that you show that A and B are associated. And that shows that there's a risk factor. So what you're showing is that high lipid diet is associated in populations who have high cardiovascular disease. So you can look at the Scots and the, in Scotland, people have, generally speaking, a high level of fat in the diet. And they also have high levels of cardiovascular disease. Likewise, if you compare the Scots to, say, people in Mediterranean countries like Italy, they will have a Mediterranean diet, which is lower in fat and lower levels of cardiovascular disease. But other ways of showing statistical correlation that involve more causal ideas is you can do interventional trials. That is, you can add A and see if it causes B. So if you add high fat to the diet of a rat, say a spontaneously hypertensive rat, then that rat will develop things that look like coronary artery disease. So that would be one piece of evidence. You could also remove A to prevent B. So that would be if you removed fat from the diet, that would that prevent cardiovascular disease? Well, they've done studies showing that large populations on the DASH diet have lower levels of coronary heart disease. But showing statistical correlation is not necessarily enough to convince the scientific establishment. You also want to show a mechanism because far more scientists will believe you if there is evidence for a plausible reason why A causes B. Now, here's a piece of data that comes from the Framingham study after a 25-year follow-up. It shows that the lipid hypothesis alone does not explain most coronary heart disease. If you look at the his, histograms of the total cholesterol levels in two different populations, one who ends up with coronary heart disease and the other who ends up without coronary heart disease, you see that there is a slight increase in the mean of total cholesterol for those with coronary heart disease. But that does not mean that the vast majority of population necessarily is going to, it's not as though this says, have lipids will get coronary heart disease. Over 50% of coronary heart disease occurs in people with a total cholesterol level below the population mean. So what does this mean? Well, the conclusion from the Framingham study concerning cholesterol levels in coronary heart disease is high cholesterol levels are neither necessary nor sufficient for coronary heart disease. They're neither necessary nor sufficient. Oh, how do the statistical risks justify prophylactic drug treatment given that low levels of hypercholesterolemia have no symptoms. Stay tuned to find out.